So in this video we're going to take on the topic of options and covered warrants. Now clearly in a short video I can't do the whole of options and covered warrants. If I could I wouldn't be standing here, I'd be in the Bahamas. Um, so what we're going to do is an introduction, the basics of options and covered warrants, not a kind of compressed degree course. Okay, so with that in mind we're going to look at the practical aspects of what are options, what are covered warrants. Now those are very similar products actually. If you understand an option, you're pretty much 95% of the way to understanding a covered warrant. Um, and who uses them and what for. Uh, in the current uh, volatile market, derivatives like options are popular in some hands. Uh, so should you get involved uh, and what would be the risks uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, first of all, Two words, options. Those tend to be what uh, professional traders are used to dealing with. Um, we'll do an example of one in a moment. Covered warrants are the very similar retail equivalent. So um, when you see um, adverts for uh, products, for example, in the retail market, they often have a slightly different name to the product that's familiar to the, if you want to call it the wholesale market, the trading market, but it doesn't matter too much because the two are very, very similar. Um, everything I say about options can be broadly applied to covered warrants. So first of all, we are dealing with a derivative. Now there are basically only three types of derivative, no matter what anyone else tells you. There are forwards and futures. We're not doing those in this video, we'll do those in another video. There are swaps. Now I have done an introduction to swaps in another video, so I'm going to leave that to that video. And there are options, and those are your basic three types of derivative. And don't forget, a derivative is simply something that derives its value from something else. And an option is a classic example, and we'll take a look at one in just a minute. Now this world is full of jargon. So as I go along, I'll be explaining some of the jargon. Don't be frightened by it. Uh, it's designed to make the people who sell these things more money. But fundamentally, once you get head, your head around the basic jargon, it's not as bad as it first seems. OK, so just a reminder, how are we going to use whatever these things are? OK, and there are basically two uses for any derivative. Um, you can speculate with them. Or you can do something called hedging. Okay, speculating is what it sounds like. There is a way of using these, and we haven't seen one yet, but there is a way of using these simply to try and gamble on rising or falling stock prices, let's say, and make some money that way. Um, and hedging is more like, well, I'm worried about my share portfolio falling in value. What can I do about it? Obvious answer, sell all my shares. Or wait for the market to fall and buy them all back again. But actually that can be a bit of a hassle, it's expensive, it takes time and it might even trigger a tax bill. So another possibility would be to hang on to your shares and if you're worried about the market falling buy yourself a put option or a put covered warrant. And I'll explain that language in just a moment. Okay, now the best thing to do with options is to get straight in. Let's create an imaginary option and take a look at some of the features. Okay, and these features pretty much stand good for covered warrants as well. All right, so let's, let's put an option up on the board here. Uh, now, the language of options. If you are looking to buy an asset, you are looking to call it to you. Imagine standing in a pit trading these things, you'd call an asset over. So you have call options that give the right to buy something. Um, if I want to dump an asset, I literally put it away. So we have options that uh, give you the right to get rid of assets or sell them at a certain price in the future. So we'll be looking at call and put options. And we'll be doing it from two perspectives. Um, options in the old days were literally pieces of paper. So you could either write the piece of paper and then sell it, or you could buy the piece of paper and hold it. So the holder is another, another word for buyer, and the writer is another word for seller. That will become more clear in a moment. So, a bit of language in there up front. Let's take a look at one. So, so if I was to write out an option on a piece of paper, what sort of language would it use? Well, it might say, this is the right to buy 1,000 ABC shares at four pounds, that's 400p each, 
any time in the next three months. So that could quite literally be a piece of paper. I could take a piece of paper and write that on it. That would mean I've created the option, I've decided the terms, and therefore if I'm going to sell this piece of paper, I'll be setting the price for it, because this isn't going to be free if I sell it to somebody else. And it'll become apparent why in a moment, if it isn't already. So what is this thing? Um, it gives the right to buy. That makes it, in the language of options, a call option. If I put the word sell there, it would become a put option. That's the only change I'd need to make. So, call option. This piece of paper gives somebody the right to call an asset over, in this case a thousand shares but it could be 100 ounces of gold. But anyway, we've got the right to buy, call, 1,000 ABC shares, so there's the underlying asset named um, on the piece of paper, at four pounds each. That is known in options jargon as the strike, or the strike price. And that's fixed on the piece of paper in the next three months. So there's a time period in there. So that suggests this piece of paper doesn't have an infinite life. It suggests in the language of options that at some point it expires. And that's what options do. If this piece of paper sits in a cupboard somewhere, in three months time it'll be useless. It will have expired. Because the contract says sometime in the next three months. And the fact this option could be used or exercised to buy a thousand ABC shares of four pounds each. That price, by the way, was one that I decided when I wrote the option. It's got nothing to do with the market price. The market price of ABC shares right now at the London Stock Exchange could be, let's say, three pounds seventy-five p. All right, but it's my option, so I don't have to put that price in it. I decided the price of four pounds, and in the next three months makes it flexible, American style. If it said on a particular date in three months time, it would be known as less flexible European style. So what is this thing? It's a call option. Uh, and what's it for? What's the point? Why have I just done this? Well, here's the point. I have just written the option. Now what I'm going to try and do is sell it. Now, what sort of person would buy that piece of paper? And how much would they pay? Well, as the writer, I'm going to say the premium I want for this piece of paper is, now, it's up to me, but obviously if I set it too high, no one's going to buy this option off me. So I'm going to say the premium is 30 pence per share. So what I'm offering is to sell a piece of paper to somebody else. I want some money up front for it. <clears throat> if you like, I'm not going to just give it away for nothing. So I want an upfront premium and I'm giving someone else the right to buy a thousand shares. Literally call me, if you like, demand a thousand shares off me anytime in the next three months. And if they do that, once I've sold this piece of paper on, I will have to find them and deliver them, let's say at four pounds each. So imagine, I take out the piece of paper, I write all that on it, I say, anyone want this? Premium is 30 pence per share. Well, it's on a thousand shares, so that would be 300 quid. If you like, anyone want it? And someone walks in the room and says, yeah, I'll take it. I'll have that option. I want to hold that option, Tim. I go, fine, deal. There you go, take the piece of paper, give me 300 quid, it's yours. So, I've got 300 pound in my pocket. Great. No prizes for guessing why I'm in this game. I just made 300 pound off a piece of paper. And what's more, I made it up front. Doesn't get any better than that. How many investments can you name where I get 300 pound in my pocket up front? So, as the person who wrote the option out and then sold it, I'm quids in from the beginning. So the question is, why did that mug who just walked in through the door buy the option? Like, why'd they just give me 300 pound for a piece of paper? That's mad. There must be something in it for them. And the answer is there is. If, if the share price now takes off, which is what they're gambling on, if you like, they can make money. How? Okay, that's the market price. That's gonna move. This strike isn't. So let's move that price. So we, you know, we've got three months, so the holder of the option sitting there with this piece of paper doesn't have to use it today or tomorrow or next week, any time in the next three months or it expires. So there's the price. Let's move that market price. So that's the London Stock Exchange price. Let's move that up. So two weeks later, two weeks time, 450p. Okay, I'll look that up at the London Stock Exchange. ABC share price has shot up. Now, the price on this piece of paper hasn't moved. It's fixed, it's a contract, okay? So what does the person I sold the option to do? They phone me up, they go, Tim, um, I'd like those 1,000 shares now, please. 
Uh, and I go, oh damn, what 1,000 shares? Oh yeah, I wrote that piece of paper out uh, a few weeks ago. Right, what's on it? Um, oh, okay, so they ring me up and say, Tim, I want 1,000 shares off you, and I want them at four pounds each. And I say, well, well, well the market price is four pound 50, and they go, tough. You sold me this piece of paper, you've got to deliver 1,000 shares at four pound each. And that's right, it's a contract. I have got to deliver 1,000 shares at four pound each. So I go into the London Stock Exchange, I go to the market, I buy a thousand shares for four pound fifty, and in tears, I hand them on to the person who bought the option off me for four pounds. Okay. Now, that's a bit of a pain for me. I've spent four pound fifty buying shares. I have to deliver to the holder of this option at four pounds each. Okay. However, the holder is laughing potentially because the holder of the option makes a nice little profit out of this. Let's see how that works. The holder of the option basically says to me, Tim, I want a thousand shares for four pound each and I deliver them for four pound each, let's say. They sell them straight away at the market price of four pounds 50. So the market price, four pounds 50. The strike price on the option was four pounds. So by demanding those shares off me, they're 50 pence per share up as a profit. But when they're doing their homework on how much money they've made overall, they did pay a premium up front at the start. So if you're gonna work out your overall profit, you've got to factor that in. So there's the premium of 30 pence per share to knock off, because that was paid up front by the person who walked in the room and bought the option. So that still leaves them 20p up per share. On well, 1,000 shares, that's 200 pound. So that's not too bad. So the call option has made money for the person who held it when prices rose. And that's the point, call options. People who buy call options are generally gambling, gambling on prices rising. The people who write and sell them obviously want to bank an easy premium up front. So obviously my life would have been a lot easier if I'd just taken the 30 pence per share premium the market price of ABC shares had plummeted and then whoever had the option would never have phoned me. I mean, why would they? Let's say the market price had plummeted in this three month period to only three pounds per share. Why would the person who's holding the option phone me and demand shares for four pounds that they can buy in the open market for three pounds unless they're a lunatic, okay? They won't. They'll go into the market and buy them for three pounds if that's what they wanna do and the option will go in the bin. So call options, make money when prices rise. Same is true of call covered warrants. Almost everything I've said could apply to a covered warrant. And that's really the point of them. <clears throat> now, one fact could be changed here. And basically that would flip my perspective and the person who buys the piece of paper's perspective round. Let's change that one word, okay? So I'm gonna run put options a little faster. Very, very similar facts. So imagine, back to the beginning, very, very, very similar facts, okay? So I take out a piece of paper and I write on it. This gives somebody the right to sell. So new piece of paper, 1,000 ABC shares at the same strike of four pounds in the next three months. So I've literally changed one word to make a slightly different piece of paper. And let's make that the word put. Put option or a put warrant. Now, um, basically what, what's changed here? So this is the right to sell a thousand shares at four pounds each sometime in the next three months. Okay, I'm charging a premium for this piece of paper in the same way as I did just now, all right? And now what I'm doing basically is reversing me and the person who buys the options perspective. Because what I've done is I've written out this piece of paper and someone's walked in the room and bought it off me. And they've paid me 30 pence per share or 300 pounds in total. So what are they thinking now? Why would someone buy or hold a put option that I've just written? And the answer is, they're worried about prices falling this time around. Okay, not rising, but falling. So imagine if you will, uh, someone walks in, says, yeah, Tim, I'll take that option off you at uh, a price of um, four pounds 
or 400 pence strike per share at a price of 30 pence per share as a premium. So I'll pay you 300 pound for this option. And let's imagine the market price of the share, ABC, starts to plummet. Okay, so let's say I get a phone call from the person who's holding this option when the market price has hit, let's say, three pounds or 300 pence. And what's happening here is they're saying, um, right, whoever's got the option phones me up, says, Tim, I want to exercise the put you wrote, all right, that I'm holding. So what they're trying to do now is to say, Tim, I want to dump a thousand shares on you at four pounds each. So this time I have no choice but to buy a thousand shares at four pounds each, and then it's up to me what I do with them, because the option's been exercised. Why is the holder exercising the option? Because potentially they can make good money. What they could do is go into the market, buy a thousand shares at three pounds each, the market price, exercise the option to get rid of them on me, not to anybody, on me, because I wrote the option, at four pounds, so the strike price is 400p, and that's a profit of 100 pence per share. In other words, they've gone into the market, bought the shares for 300, dumped them on me for 400, taken a profit of 100p. But they paid me a premium up front, and that's non-refundable. Option holders always pay a non-refundable upfront premium, so let's knock that off. That was 30p. So they're making a pretty sizable profit of 70 pence per share. On well, 1,000 shares, that's 700 pounds. Okay, so that's the point of a put option. It is designed basically to make money when prices fall in the hands of the holder. Now, you might say to yourself, well, well, Tim, why did you ever write this option in the first place? Why did you write and sell a put option? And the answer is, of course, I was hoping this wouldn't happen. I was hoping it wouldn't get exercised. I was hoping that the ABC shares would lift off and I won't get the phone call. I mean, why would someone phone me and say, Tim, I'd like to sell ABC shares at 400p using this contract if the market price is 600p? Well, they wouldn't. They'd sell them in the market. So the option would expire and I'd get to keep my 300 pound. All right, so that changes the viewpoint of the holder and the writer, as they're called. Now, I'm gonna finish off on this uh, introductory video uh, with some observations here. So we have two basic types of option and covered warrant, the call and the put. Call options in the hands of the buyer are normally seen as bullish pieces of paper and put options bearish, okay? Uh, and basically, what are they used for? Well, you can use them to speculate. You can simply gamble using a call option on rising prices, on a, on a put, put option on falling prices. But you could also use them to protect yourself. I mean, imagine, for example, I'm holding a whole load of ABC shares and worrying about the price falling, but I don't want to sell them all right now. I want to keep hold of them. A put option could be one way to get a kind of insurance contract, if you like. You know, the right to sell these shares if I need to for 400p each could be a way of sort of protecting myself, in which case the premium I pay up front for a put option is kind of like an insurance premium on a car. You know, I might need the piece of paper or I might not, and I'm prepared to pay up front for that choice. That's what I'm paying for, the right to put the piece of paper in the bin or actually use it to get rid of shares. So that's the way you sort of hedge your position, if you like. The other thing uh, about options to realize is simply this, they change in value, all right? So what I'm suggesting here is that Maybe I buy a put option, okay, and the market price of the underlying share starts to plummet. This is the point. Because the option lasts three months, the further the underlying share price falls in the next three months, the more valuable this piece of paper becomes, allowing whoever's got it to dump shares at four pounds each. So the point is, the price, the premium will change as the market price of the underlying share changes. So with options, quite often you don't end up having to make a phone call to buy or sell a thousand shares at all. You simply buy the option for a premium of 30 pence per share, and then you sell it on within the three month period to somebody else who wants it for 50 pence per share, let's say, and make a profit that way. So in other words, you make a profit simply between the amount you paid in premium to buy the option and the amount you offload 
as a premium to sell it on somebody else. In, in that sense, it's almost like almost like a sort of tradable insurance contract, if you like. Except obviously you can't trade your car insurance policy, but imagine if you could, um, an option can be traded on in that way because the premium will alter depending on what the underlying share price is actually doing. Okay, so <clears throat> in summary, options are a little bit fiddly. They have quite a few terms and there's quite a lot of jargon and they're not for everybody. Covered warrants are the retail equivalent of an option and follow all the same principles. So in summary, why would I buy a cool covered warrant? It will be some kind of gamble that prices were going to rise. Okay? If I was buying a put option or a put covered warrant, I would be thinking as the buyer or the holder that prices were going to fall. And I could be either a speculator, trying to make a quick buck out of that, or I could be somebody looking to hedge a fall in price in some shares that I already own. Are these the most straightforward way to hedge falling prices? No. Okay, there are other options around. There are spread bets, which are frankly simpler. They have their risks, but they are a little bit more straightforward, and I cover those in another video. And there are things called inverse ETFs, which I'll be covering in a future video fairly soon. All right, so there are other ways to deal with falling prices. And for some people, options and covered warrants are quite jargon filled, a little bit technical to understand, and therefore sort of not for them. All right, so if you're gonna get into this world, I would say do some homework, get comfortable with the jargon, look at your broker's website, look at how they operate, look at how prices work uh, before you jump in. But for anybody who does their homework and understands the jargon, they can be one weapon in the fight against uh, right now, let's say, falling prices.